goal we had starting off was really to try and take close quarters combat to the next level. The great part about it is you never know how it's going to play. You never know what's going to happen. You, you almost forget you're playing the game because it just looks real. Where is it? Other games have done monsters that jump out of the closet at you. And what we've really tried to do is get under your skin. Hush now, Mr. Moody. The time for talk is done. It was amazing. I mean, I've never seen so unique a game. It's not about up in your face monsters. It's about really messing with the player's mind. It wasn't until I started playing that I really got it. It breaks so many of the standard conventions of what you would expect out of a first person shooter. It's gonna be probably like A-list game. This is the first person shooter title that I've always hoped that my other titles would be. I think it was the first time we really had a chance to kind of start from scratch. We weren't making a sequel to another game. Um, we had been thinking about kind of the core concept of a, a really uh, a, a game that had a lot of action in it. It was just based on kind of the action movie experience. From the very beginning, we always talked about it as being like an action movie. At its core, it's a very intense, visceral shooter with a little bit of a twist of the supernatural. When we started off, we really worked with a lot of people to nail down the scope of what the game is going to be and who are we marketing to because we really wanted to make a game that's going to appeal to more people. You guys about done up there? Our day just getting started. This team has always been very focused on trying to tell a good story with the game. We try to not just make it about you know going around and, and shooting bad guys who are popping out of every corner. There is a, a hopefully a compelling story, all the things that you know make movies exciting. They really wanted to create this John Woo style action movie blended with elements of the ring. Um, so that was their focus from the beginning. You know, they're avid consumers of all other types of media, so they know what's scary, they know what's fun. The horror element actually suggested itself and seemed to fit right in with the, the story that we had come up with initially, which did have some kind of paranormal elements to it already. The key thing is the blending of this over-the-top, just visceral action game with um, just great elements of horror that are tied in with suspense and just the whole eeriness of it. Getting that sort of feel inside an action game just hasn't been done yet. Storytelling structure hasn't changed for thousands of years at least. You know, in all recorded stories, they have some key structural elements. Craig's really good at adapting the story to fit within our, the capabilities of what we could do within the game. Because it is a game and because the player is a participant, the more you can do real time with the player in control, the more immersive the experience becomes. Monolith has taken you know a lot of care not to be you know in your face with the uh, you know the kind of scary moments or the or the gore even. There's a lot of times it's it's what you don't see is scarier than than what you do see. You're genuinely creeped out. When you're testing something specific, you can get very focused on it. And there was a particular scene where Alma, the little girl, I had placed her, I had her walking across a doorway, and I had sort of forgotten that she was there. So I'm walking around looking at the lighting and the scene, and I turn around and catch her out of the corner of my eye, and I just completely freaked out because I had forgotten she was there, and she's just standing there kind of looking at me. Oh, it's, it's chilling. In our bathrooms, they have the round ceiling lights, and one of them was burnt out, and uh, the other one was flickering. There's been a number of times where I've walked into the bathroom and turned on the light, and in the mirror, seen a dark shadow behind the door as I closed it. One day, uh, John Mulkey came running into my office, and he's like, there's like this shadow in the bathroom, and it's freaking me out. I can't stand it. I swear it happened. No one believes me. And it was weird because I went in there and I was kind of laughing at myself and yeah, whatever. And I walked in there, I'm like, God, this is a freaky room. This is scary. We don't use that bathroom as much anymore. One of the biggest challenges we had was overcoming the technological hurdle. Uh, this technology is getting so much more realistic and detailed that the time and the resources it takes to actually finish and complete a world is increase you know fivefold but the resources have maybe only increased you know by 30 percent so we're having to become much more creative and using tools to allow us to create that kind of content we've spent a lot a lot of time just trying to make the the combat sequences as intense as we possibly can so to do that we're, we're utilizing all the strengths of the technology 
dynamic lights, you know, hanging lights in a room that move as soon as, you know, you start shooting and stray bullets hit them. Objects that'll fly around with the physics. You're playing the game and at first you, you look at it and go, wow, is this a screenshot? But it's not. It's you're, you're in the game. Yeah, you shoot a gun into um, pretty much anything, a lot of pieces are going to fly out. Um, and it sounds kind of like a simple concept, but it's, it's hard for games to pull that off and make it look realistic. So on the technology side, we knew if we wanted to do that, we were going to have to have thousands of these particles. We wanted them to move realistically. So it feels like you're in a firefight. It feels like, you know, someone's shooting at you, there's bullets whizzing by, there's chunks of the wall being blown out, there's smoke and, you know, shell casings flying and just, you know, chaos, just utter chaos. I believe that uh, being able to see your body in a first-person game is the future, and I think that we we're one of the first that have really pulled it off in a way that's big. So now you look down and you see your feet, you see your arms, and you feel like you are in the world. We wanted to even make it more interactive with uh, the hand-to-hand -hand combat, so you can do these scissor kicks and slide kicks and, and uh, roundhouse kicks, and you feel like you're, you're a badass. We'd played games where you are part of a special forces team, but the enemies are always just standing around. We wanted to play against a special forces team, so the AI just had to be phenomenal. The evolution of AI in gaming has been one driven by the, the demand of the players. These days, people are looking for a deeper experience. They want a greater challenge and deeper immersion. Pretty much the whole gameplay revolves around the AI. Um, you're interacting with the AI. So how the AI interacts with you is how much you can get immersed in the game. We place a lot of hints in the environment that the AI can use. So when you come into a situation where you've got bad guys rushing into a space, what they do is really based upon your actions. If you decide to take cover and head off in one direction, the AI will have a number of available options presented to them because of what you do. The cool thing about the AI in fear is it's not scripted, it's part of their behavior. So they'll walk out to an area and they'll evaluate what they want to do uh, to get at the player, to get away from the player. Uh, so in each time they do that, it could be different. We have an assassin character who can cloak and cling to walls and jump over railings and comes right up on top of you. We've also added uh, the squad behavior for the AI. So now when you come into an area, you have to fight the whole squad. It's not just each individual AI by themselves. They can communicate with each other. You'll hear them talk about uh, he's behind the wall or uh, he's trying to flank us. It comes back to that focus on the close quarters combat, the experience of being in a space with a, a squad of enemies and fighting them and defeating them is really, really satisfying. And that's our greatest achievement on this game. Our audio department has been outstanding on all of our projects. I think every game that we've made, we've always gotten you know 90% or above on our audio ratings. It's a testament to the detail that these guys put into our projects. Audio, from a sound effects standpoint, is all about really bringing in the player into that world. Um, and then there's, of course, music. Music's one of the most important elements of a game like Fear. When you think about what is really conveying the um, um, emotional aspect of, uh, of the events and, and as you're sort of piecing the story together as you're playing, it's pretty much the most powerful way to do it. You actually have something there that really gives you a sense of what that feels like and you can't describe it. You know, you can really only describe it with, with music. The music we did for Fear was a conscious effort to try to be somewhat minimalistic. We didn't want to have soundtracks playing throughout the game. We wanted something that just kind of blended in with the environment and, and the ambience, just to keep people on, on edge. This game is all about flipping people's expectations around the way it's been designed. It means that the first idea that you get is not necessarily the right one. In fact, in, in more cases than not, it's probably not going to be the right one. Quality assurance is one of the key factors that we have and one of the key tools for product development.
to make sure that the game is tuned right, that the balance is there, that the levels feel fun, that the pacing's right, um, is it too hard to play? So all those things are crucial that you get that feedback from QA. Fears had a longer test cycle than a lot of our projects, but this is one that we really knew that everyone was going to work really hard to try and get right. The developer gives us a build once a week and we bang away at it. We have all sorts of checklists that we got to run, and on a daily basis, I'll create a report and hand it over to Mike. Willie does all the work, he just makes me look good. Have you seen this one before? The testers are fans of the game, which is a great thing to see. Our goal was to try and play the game as early as possible so we could evolve it based on playing it, building something, playing it, tweaking it, playing it again. Well, sometimes, if I come from the left, it'll do it, but sometimes from the right. It's been really, really great working with Monolith. They value the testers' input. They value the things that they have to say, and that shows in the game. Now we're actually getting into more formalized play testing, where you're behind the glass and you watch a group of people play. Brian skipped the intro. Oh, really? He must not have known what he was doing. He must not have. How would you guys describe the difficulty level of the game? Was it about right or was it, was it actually... That part was really hard. I, I only passed it like right at the end. I like the fact that they're listening to my opinion and that um, that as a gamer, they're trying to make the experience better. And action. So it's a big week in development for uh, For Fear. Here we are, you know, getting up to beta and we're putting in the final sequence. The last two levels are going in at this moment, making sure that it is just right and has that, you know, final payoff for the player. Fear is one of those uh, great products that uh, marketers dream about. I think the approach in this particular case was to do something with a little more texture, a little more sophistication. We needed to do something that wasn't paint by the numbers. I wanted to make certain that we got a campaign that clearly showed how this game was not like any other game that you'd ever seen. It looks like uh, fear is really coming together. Like Everything we're doing is very, very exciting. It's probably uh, one of the biggest PC launches that we've had. And everything we've kind of done has been very minimalistic. We're giving out as little information as we can, but keeping it interesting. We haven't released much of the story, and we're not going to, because this is like a movie. There are some serious twists uh, all the way through. We had this event in, uh, in Dallas, Texas, at the CPL 2005 event. We had hundreds of fans waiting for over an hour to get a chance to play the game in a tournament that we set up. Uh, the game's amazing. Bottom line, it's awesome. People, you know, going off from the booth with their Fear t-shirt, it was the hit of the show. The, the buzz around the title couldn't be larger. One of the most important initiatives that we have is what's known as our Director's Edition. We are going to do a live action series of one minute vignette movies. This is going to be really cool. And we're going to put these six parts of this movie on the Director's Edition as well. And action. Hello, Alma. I'm Dr. Green. To check up on you, see how you've been feeling. They know this is a special title that they're going to want to get, load up, turn the lights down, turn the sound really up, and just have one of these great gaming experiences that don't come around that often. I'm really excited that we, we had a vision and I think we nailed it. We're just going to make the best game we can and hope that everybody loves it, um, but it's exciting that other people are sharing the excitement. I had great expectations for Fear, but it's like seeing and playing it, it's, it's totally surpassed those. It's not often you come across a product that has this sort of magical blend of ingredients that can drive its own buzz just by the very nature of what the idea is and who's making it. It's probably going to be kind of hard to play this game by myself with the lights off. I'll probably play it, but maybe with the lights on during the day. I've never seen anything like it. It's addictive.